Section six of Astounding Stories sixteen, may nineteen thirty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Chapters three and four. Chapter three. Back at Maricopa Flying Field, the daily routine had been disturbed. There were conferences of officers, instructions from Colonel Boynton, and a curiosity provoking lack of explanations. Only with Captain Blake did the Colonel indulge in any discussion. "'We'll keep this under our hats,' he said, and out of the newspapers as long as we can. You can imagine what the yellow journals would do with a scarehead like that. Why, they would have us all wiped off the map and the country devastated by imaginary fleets in the first three paragraphs.' Blake regarded his superior gravely. "'I feel somewhat the same way myself, Colonel,' he admitted, "'when I think what this can mean.' some other country so far ahead of us in air force that we are back in the dark ages well it doesn't look any too good to me if they mean trouble we will meet it when it comes said colonel boynton but between ourselves i am in the same state of mind the whole occurrence is so damn mysterious washington hasn't a whisper of information of any such construction the secretary admitted that last night it's a surprise a complete surprise to everyone but blake you get that new ship ready as quickly as you can. Prepare for an altitude test the same as we planned, but get into the air the first minute possible. She ought to show a better ceiling than anything we have here, and you may have to fly high to say good morning to that liner you saw. Put all the mechanics on it that can work to advantage. I think they have it pretty well along now. Engines tested and installed, sir, was Blake's instant report. I think I can take it up this afternoon. He left immediately to hurry to the hangar, where a new plane stood glistening in pristine freshness, and where hurrying mechanics grumbled under their breaths at the sudden rush for a ship that was expected to take the air a week later. An altitude test under full load. Well, what of it? they demanded one of another. Wouldn't another day do as well as this one? And they worked as they growled, worked with swift sureness and skill, and the final instruments took their place in the ship that she might roll from the hangar complete under that day's sun. Her supercharger was tested, the adjunct to a powerful engine that would feed the hungry cylinders with heavy air up in the heights where the air is thin. There were oxygen flasks to keep life in the pilot in the same thin air, and the hot southern sun made ludicrous that afternoon the bulky, heavily wrapped figure of Captain Blake as he sat at the controls and listened approvingly to the roaring engine. He waved good-bye, and smiled understandingly as he met the eyes of Colonel Boynton, then pulled on his helmet, settled himself in his seat, and took off in a thunderous blast of sound to begin his long ascent. He had long since cracked open the valve of his oxygen flask when the climb was ended, and his goggles were frosted in the arctic cold so that it was only with difficulty he could read his instrument board. That's the top, he thought, in that mind so light and so curiously not his own. He throttled the engine and went into a long spiral that was to end within a rod of where he had started on the brown sun-baked field. The last rays of the sun were slanting over distant mountains as he climbed stiffly from the machine. "'Better than fifty thousand, exulted Colonel Boynton. Of course your barograph will have to be calibrated and verified, but it looks like a record, Blake, and you had a full load. Ready to go up and give Mary Hell to that other ship if she shows up?' he asked but Captain Blake shook a dubious head. Fifty thousand is just a start for that bird,' he said. "'You didn't see them shoot out of sight, Colonel. Lord knows when they quit their climb, or where.' "'Well, we'll just have a squadron ready in any event,' the Colonel assured him. "'We will make him show his stuff or take a beating, if that is what he wants.' They were in the Colonel's office. "'You had better go and get warmed up,' he told the flyer. "'Then come back here for instructions.' but Blake was more anxious for information than for other comforts. "'I'm all right,' he said. "'Just tired a bit. Let me stretch out here, Colonel, and give me the dope on what you expect of our visitor, and what we will do.' He settled back comfortably in a big chair. The office was warm, and Blake knew now he had been doing a day's work. "'We will just take it as it comes,' Colonel Boynton explained. "'I can't for the life of me figure why the craft was spying around here. What are they looking for?' We haven't any big secrets the whole world doesn't know. Of course he may not return, but if he does I want you to go up and give him the once-over. I can trust you to note every significant detail. You saw no wings. 
If it is a dirigible, let's know something of their power and how they can throw themselves up in the air the way you described. Watch for anything that may serve to identify it, and its probable place of manufacture, any peculiarity of marking or design or construction that may give us a lead. Then return and report. Blake nodded his understanding of what was wanted, but his mind was on further contingencies. He wanted definite instructions. And, he asked, if they attack, what then? Is their fire to be returned? If they make one single false move, said Colonel Boynton savagely, give them everything you've got, and the 91st Squadron will be off the ground to support you at the first sign of trouble. We don't want to start anything, nor appear to do so, but by the gods, Blake, this fellow means trouble eventually as sure as you're a flyer, and we won't wait for him to ask for it twice. They sat in silence while the field outside became shrouded in night, and they speculated as best they could from the few facts they had as to what this might mean to the world, to their country, to themselves. It was an hour before Blake was aware of the fact that he was hungry. He rose to leave, but paused while Colonel Boynton answered the phone. The first startled exclamation held him rigid while he tried to piece together the officer's curt responses and guess at what was being told. "'Colonel Boynton speaking. "'McGuire?' "'Yes, Lieutenant. "'Over Mount Lawson?' "'Yes, yes, the same ship. "'I've no doubt.' His voice was even and cool in contrast to the excited tones that carried faintly to Blake standing by. "'Quite right,' he said shortly. "'You will remain where you are. "'Act as observer. "'Hold this line open and keep me informed. "'Captain Blake will leave immediately for observation. "'A squadron will follow. "'Let me know promptly what you see.' He turned abruptly to the waiting man. "'It is back,' he said. "'We're in luck. Over the observatories at Mount Lawson. Descending, so Lieutenant McGuire says. Take the same ship you had up today. Look them over. Get up close. Good luck.' He turned again to the phone. There were planes rolling from their hangars before Blake could reach his own ship. Their engines were thundering. Men were rushing across the field, pulling on leather helmets and coats as they ran, all this while he warmed up his engine. A mechanic thrust in a package of sandwiches and a thermos of coffee while he waited, and Captain Blake grinned cheerfully and gulped the last of his food as he waved to the mechanics to pull out the wheel blocks. He opened the throttle and shot out into the dark. He climbed and circled the field saw the waving motion of lights in red and green that marked the take-off of the planes of the 91st, and he straightened out on a course that in less than two hours would bring him over the heights of Mount Lawson and the mystery that awaited him there. And he fingered the trigger grip that was part of the stick and nodded within his dark cockpit at the rattle of a machine-gun that merged its staccato notes with the engine's roar. But he felt, as he thought of that monster shape, as some primordial man might have felt, setting forth with a stone in his hand to wage war on a Saurian beast. CHAPTER Four. If Colonel Boynton could have stood with one of his lieutenants and Professor Sykes on a mountain top, he would have found, perhaps, the answer to his question. He had wondered in a puzzled fashion why the great ship had shown its mysterious presence over the flying field. He had questioned whether it was indeed the field that had been the object of their attention, or whether in the cloudy murk they had merely wandered past. Could he have seen with the eyes of Lieutenant McGuire the descent of the great shape over Mount Lawson, he would have known beyond doubt that here was the magnet that drew the eyes of whatever crew was manning the big craft. It was dark where the two men stood. Others had come running at their call, but their forms, too, were lost in the shadows of the towering pines. The light from an open door struck across an open space beyond which McGuire and Professor Sykes stood alone, stood silent and spellbound, their heads craned back at a neck-wrenching angle. They were oblivious to all discomforts. Their eyes and their whole minds were on the unbelievable thing in the sky. Beyond the fact that no lights were showing along the hull, there was no effort at concealment. The moon was up now to illumine the scene, and it showed plainly the gleaming cylinder, with its long body, and blunt shining ends, dropping slowly, inexorably down. "'Like a dirigible,' said McGuire huskily. "'But the size, man, the size, and its shape is not right. It isn't streamlined correctly. The air—' He stopped his half-unconscious analysis abruptly. "'The air! What had this craft to do with the air? 
a thin layer of gas that hung close to the earth, the skin on an apple, and beyond, space. There was the ethereal ocean in which this great shape swam. The reality of the big ship, the very substance of it, made the spaceship idea the harder to grasp. Lieutenant McGuire found that it was easier to see an imaginary craft taking off into space than to conceive of this monstrous shape, many hundreds of tons in weight, being thrown through vast emptiness. Yet he knew, he knew, and his mind was a chaos of grim threats and forebodings as he looked at the unbelievable reality and tried to picture what manner of men were watching, peering from those rows of ports. At last it was motionless. It hung soundless and silent, except for a soft roar a scant thousand feet in the air, and its huge bulk was dwarfing the giant pines, the rounded buildings. It threw the men's familiar surroundings into a new and smaller scale. He had many times flown over these mountains, and Lieutenant McGuire had seen the silvery domes of the observatories shining among the trees, like fortresses for aerial defense, he had thought, and the memory returned to him now. What did these newcomers think of them? Had they too found them suggestive of forts on the frontier of a world, defenses against invasion from out there? Or did they know them for what they were? Did they wish only to learn the extent of our knowledge, our culture? Were they friendly, perhaps, half timid and fearful of what they might find? A star moved in the sky, a pinpoint of light that was plain in its message to the aviator. It was Blake, flying high, volplaning to make contact and learn from the air what this stranger might mean. The light of his plane slanted down in an easy descent. The flyer was gliding in on a long aerial toboggan slide. His motor was throttled. There was only the whistle of torn air on the monoplane's wings. McGuire was with the captain in his mind, and like him he was waiting for whatever the stranger might do. Other lights were clustered where the one plane had been. The men of the 91st had their orders, and the fingers of the watching silent man gripped an imaginary stick while he wished with his whole heart that he was up in the air, to be with Blake or the others. His thoughts whipped back to the mysterious stranger. The great shape was in motion. It rose sharply a thousand feet in the air. The approaching plane showed clear in the moon's light. It swung and banked, and the vibrant song of its engine came down to the men as Blake swept in a great circle about the big ship. He was looking it over, but he began his inspection at a distance, and the orbit of his plane made a tightening spiral as he edged for a closer look. He was still swinging in the monotonous round when the ship made its first forward move. It leaped in the air. It swept faster and faster and it was moving with terrific speed as it crashed silently through the path of the tiny plane. And Blake, as he leaned forward on the stick to throw his plane downward in a power dive, could have had a vision, not of a ship in the air, but only of a shining projectile as the great monster shrieked overhead. McGuire trembled for the safety of those wings, as he saw Blake pull his little ship out of the dive and shoot upward to a straight climb. But— That's dodging them, he exulted. That's flying! I wonder, did they mean to wipe him out, or were they only scared off?" His question was answered as, out of the night, a whistling shriek proclaimed the passage of the meteor ship that drove unmistakably at the lone plane. And again the pilot with superb skill waited until the last moment and threw himself out of the path of the oncoming mass, though his own plane was tossed and whirled like an autumn leaf in the vortex that the enemy created. Not a second was lost as Blake opened his throttle and forced his plane into a steep climb. Atta boy, said McGuire, as if words could span across to the man in the plane. Altitude, Blake, get altitude. The meteor had turned in a tremendous circle, so swift its motion that it made an actual line of light as the moon marked its course, and the curved line straightened abruptly to a flashing mark that shot straight toward the struggling plane. This time another sound came down to the listening ears of the two men. The plane tore head-on to meet the onslaught, to swing at the last instant in a frantic leap that ended as before in the maelstrom of air back of the ship. But the muffled roar was changed, punctured with a machine-gun's familiar rattle and the stabbing flashes from Blake's ship before he threw it out of the other's path were a song of joy to the tense nerves of the men down below. The deadly rush could only be construed as an attack, and Blake was fighting back. The very speed of the great projectile must hold it to its course. 
The faster it went, the more difficult to swerve it from a line. This and much more was flashing sharply in McGuire's mind. But Blake, alone against this huge antagonist. It was coming back, another rush like a star through space. And McGuire shouted aloud in a frenzy of emotion as a cluster of lights came falling from on high. No lone machine-gun now that tore the air with this clattering bedlam of shots. The planes of the 91st Squadron were diving from the heights. They came on a steep slant that seemed marking them for crashing death against the huge cylinder flashing past. And their stabbing needles of machine-gun fire made a drumming tattoo, till the planes, with the swiftness of hawks, swept aside, formed to groups, tore on down toward the ground, and then curved in great circles of speed to climb back to the theatre of action. Lieutenant McGuire was rigid and quivering. He should go to the phone and report to the Colonel, but the thought left him as quickly as it came. He was frozen in place, and his mind could hold only the scene that was being pictured before him. The enemy ship had described its swift curve, and the planes of the defenders were climbing desperately for advantage. So slowly they moved as compared with the swiftness of the other. But the great ship was slowing. It came on, but its wild speed was checked. The light of the full moon showed plainly now what McGuire had seen but dimly before, a great metal beak on the ship, pointed and shining, a ram whose touch must bring annihilation to anything it struck. The squadron of planes made a group in the sky, and Blake's monoplane, too, was with them. The huge enemy was approaching slowly. Was it damaged? McGuire hardly dared hope. Yet that raking fire might well have been deadly. It might be that some bullets had torn and penetrated to the vitals of this ship's machinery and damaged some part. It came back slowly, ominously, toward the circling planes. Then, throwing itself through the air, it leaped not directly toward them, but off to one side. Like a stone on the end of a cord, it swung with inconceivable speed in a circle that enclosed the group of planes. Again and again it whipped around them while the planes, by comparison, were motionless. Its orbit was flat with the ground. Then, tilting, more yet, it made a last circle that stood like a hoop in the air, and behind it, as it circled, it left a faint trace of vapor. Nebulous, milky in the moonlight. But the ship had built a sphere, a great globe of the gas. And within it, like rats in a cage, the planes of the 91st Squadron were darting and whirling. Gas! groaned the watching man. Gas! What is it? Why don't they break through? The thin clouds of vapor were mingling now and expanding. They blossomed and mushroomed, and the light of the moon came in pale iridescence from their billowing folds. Break through! McGuire had prayed, and he stood in a voiceless horror as he saw the attempt. The mist was touching here and there a plane. They were engulfed, yet he could see them plainly, and he saw with staring, fear-filled eyes the clumsy tumbling and fluttering of unguided wings, as the great eagles of the ninety-first fell roaring to earth with no conscious minds guiding their flight. The valleys were deep about the mountain, and their shadowed blackness opened to receive the maimed, stricken things that came fluttering or swooping wildly to that last embrace, where, in the concealing shadows, the deeper shadows of death awaited. There was a room where a telephone waited. McGuire sensed this but dumbly, and the way to that room was long to his stumbling feet. He was blinded. His mind would not function. He saw only those fluttering things, and the moonlight on their wings, and the shadows that took them so softly at the last. One plane whistled close overhead. McGuire stopped where he stood to follow it with unbelieving eyes. That one man had lived, escaped the net. It was inconceivable. The plane returned. It was flying low and it swerved erratically as it flew. It was a monoplane, a new ship. Its motor was silenced. It stalled as he watched, to pancake and crash where the towering pines made a cradle of great branches to cushion its fall. No thought now of the colonel waiting impatiently for a report. Even the enemy, there in the sky, was forgotten. It was Blake in that ship, and he was alive, or had been, for he had cut his motor. McGuire screamed out for Professor Sykes, and there were others, too, who came running at his call. He tore recklessly through the scrub and undergrowth, and gained at last the place where the wreckage hung dangling from the trees. The fuselage of a plane, scarred and broken, was still held in the strong limbs. 
Captain Blake was in the cockpit, half hanging from the side. He was motionless, quiet, and his face shone white and ghastly as they released him and drew him out, but one hand still clung with a grip like death itself to a hose that led from an oxygen tank. McGuire stared in wonder, and slowly gathering comprehension. He was fixed for an altitude test, he said dazedly. This ship was to be used, and he was to find her ceiling. He saw what the others were getting, and he flew himself through on a jet of pure oxygen. He stopped in utter admiration of the quickness of thought that could outwit death in an instant like that. They carried the limp body to the light. No bones broken, as far as I can see, said the voice of Professor Sykes. Leave him here in the air. He must have got a whiff of their devilish mist in spite of his oxygen. He was flying mighty awkwardly when he came in here. But he was alive, and Lieutenant McGuire hastened with all speed now to the room where a telephone was ringing wildly, and a colonel of the Air Force must be told of the annihilation of a crack squadron and of a threat that menaced all the world. In that far room there were others waiting where Colonel Boynton sat with receiver to his ear. A general's uniform was gleaming in the light to make more sober by contrast the civilian clothing of that quiet, clear-eyed man who held the portfolio of the Secretary of War. They stared silently at Colonel Boynton, and they saw the blood recede from his face, while his cool voice went on unmoved with its replies. "'I understand,' he said. "'A washout, complete, except for Captain Blake. His oxygen saved him. It attacked with gas, you say?' And why did not our own planes escape? It's speed. Yes, we'll have to imagine it, but it is unbelievable. One moment. He turned to those who waited for his report. The squadron, he said with forced quiet, though his lips twitched in a bloodless line, the ninety-first is destroyed. The enemy put them down with one blow, enveloped them with gas. He recounted the essence of McGuire's report, then turned once more to the phone. Hello, Lieutenant. The enemy ship. Where is it now? He listened, listened, to a silent receiver, silent save for the sound of a shot, a crashing fall, a loud panting breath. He heard the breathing close to the distant instrument. It ended in a choking gasp. The instrument was silent in his ear. He signaled violently for the operator, ordered the ringing of any and all phones about the observatory, and listened in vain for a sound or syllable in reply. A plane, he told an orderly, at once. Phone the commercial flying field near the base of Mount Lawson. Have them hold a car ready for me. I shall land there. End of chapters 3 and 4